one of the great things about shooting in the digital age is the amount of information that the lens collects at the time of capture. And all of that information is transferred to the camera and stored in the EXIF metadata of the image. And that information can be read by software like Darktable. And in the case of Darktable, there is a module called the Lens Correction Module. As the name would suggest, it allows you to correct for certain problems with your lenses. And that is the subject of this video. Let's go. Hi, and welcome to episode 64 of Understanding Darktable. So the lens correction module, like I said, as the name would suggest, it corrects for certain deficiencies of your lens. Some lenses suffer from what is called pin cushioning, which is where the left and right sides, assuming you're shooting in a landscape orientation, have a tendency to collapse inwards a little bit. The opposite of pin cushioning is what's called barrel distortion, which is where the outside edges tend to bow outwards a little bit. Some of these effects are more pronounced on wide angle lenses than they are with zoom lenses, but they can exhibit under all kinds of circumstances. On top of pin cushioning and barrel distortion, we have things like vignetting, where the corners of the frame can sometimes appear darker than the center of the frame. Again, depends on the lens in question. Also, transverse chromatic aberration. That's a mouthful. That is where you have high contrast delineations within a composition. In other words, where you've got a really bright section and a really dark section, and the dividing line between those two areas is very sharp. And along those high contrast edges, we quite often get a little bit of a color artifact. The lens correction module will help us deal with that as well. Now, as I was getting ready to do this video, I was reading the help file from Darktable and it made reference to lens fun. And what lens fun is, is another free and open source project which maintains a database of lenses which have been built by various manufacturers for use with digital cameras. And I've got their website pulled up here. It's a very simple website and it basically has a list of all the supported lenses from all the manufacturers and then the various lenses that have been profiled. And the third column has their crop factor and it covers a whole range of lenses from a whole range of manufacturers. Now, the problem with any database is getting updates for newly built lenses. If you've rushed out and bought a lens that has just hit the market, there's always the possibility that that lens has not yet been profiled and does not exist in the lens fund database. Now you're probably thinking, well, does that really matter? No, probably not. But have a look at how many pieces of software actually use the lens fund database. It's not just Darktable and it's not just free and open source software. As you'll see, there are some commercial products out there on the market that access the lens fund database. So it is kind of important that we keep this database up to date. Now, if you have just gone out and bought some brand new lens that has not been profiled and added to the lens fund database, can you help? Absolutely. If you click on the lens calibration link here, there are four tutorials here for how to shoot some sample images with your lens that meet the specs for what lens fund needs in order to build a profile. And the great thing is, if you do it, if you take your lens, which does not exist in the database, and you follow these instructions, and you shoot some sample images that meet the specs that they need, and you submit those raw files to LensFun, 
not only will they build a profile for that particular lens and add it to the database, they'll send you a copy straight away. So you'll be the first person to have that profile for that particular lens. So that's pretty cool. So it's a good reason to get involved and submit sample images for your lens. Now, in the course of getting ready to do this video, I happen to be looking through the supported lenses list, and what do I notice? My Venus Lauer 15mm f2 manual focus lens does not exist in the database. So, one of my projects coming up is going to be to go and shoot some sample images with that lens and then submit those raw files to LensFund so that they can add that lens to the database. Now, obviously there's gonna be a little bit of a lag time between when you submit your images, when LensFund gets to build a profile, add that to the database, and then for all of those pieces of software which use the LensFund database to update to include the newly added lenses. So it's kind of a work in progress. All right, with all that said, let's now have a look at Darktable. Now, again, as I was getting ready to shoot this video, I was thinking, what image can I use that will display problems that the lens correction module might be able to work with? And I was immediately reminded of the image which was the whole subject matter of video number 18 in this series which was the kids on the beach in Vanuatu. So I went and dug that out and in its original state, oh, there's a couple of minor things been done there but nothing major, we can see that this horizon is quite bent. It sort of peaks in the middle drops off towards the outer edges, but then right at the edges it kind of turns up again. So it's definitely not straight. And if we look at the image information, we can see that this was shot with a Minolta AF DT 18 to 50, uh, sorry, 18 to 70 f3.5 to 5.6 lens, and this was a lens that was built for APS-C sensors. It was not designed for 35mm. It was shot at f3.5, 200th of a second, at 18mm, and the focal distance is not reported. Now, we can simply look at the lens correction module, which is not turned on yet. We can see that it has correctly identified that the camera was a Dynax 7D, and it's picked up that particular lens, the 18-70. to And if we switch this on, wow, straight away that horizon has become straight. It's, it's not level because my camera was obviously not perfectly aligned to parallel with the horizon, but at least now the horizon is straight instead of doing this weird wavy thing that it was doing before. You may have also noticed that there was a little bit of vignette correction applied. The darker edges have lightened up. Again, that is all part of the information contained within the profile for that particular lens. Now, once you have chosen a profile for a lens, we will see that the focal length is read here. And because this was a zoom lens, we have all of these focal lengths reported. If this was a prime lens, all we would see here would be zero and whatever is the focal length of that particular lens. We can see that the aperture was 3.5, which we saw from the image information panel as well. And the distance is reported as 1000. Now, I suspect that if your camera and lens are able to determine the focal distance at the time of capture, that information would be included in the EXIF metadata. It would appear here in the image information panel. And if that was the case, the lens correction module would also then report that information in this drop down list of values. Now, unfortunately, the Darktable manual does not explain what 
unit of measurement these values represent. I'm going to go out on a limb and say they probably refer to metres at a guess, but I don't know for sure. And I think it just defaults to 1,000 metres if it has no distance information embedded in the EXIF metadata. All right, next we've got the corrections to apply. Now, I can't remember if I mentioned it at the beginning or not, but what this module can correct for, yes, I did mention it, that's right, the types of distortion, pincushioning, barrel, transverse chromatic aberration, which is the shift in reds and blues along high contrast images, or, or high contrast areas within images, and vignetting, which is the tendency of some lenses to go a little bit darker in the outer extremities relative to the middle portion of the composition. Now, why would we want to enable or disable any of those particular functions within this module? Well, it might be that you don't want to do vignette correction in the lens correction module because you are going to use the vignette module later on. And the reason you might do that is, let's say you had a lens that exhibited darker vignetting in the bottom left and right hand corners to the top left and right hand corners. Like, so the vignetting was more pronounced at the bottom than it was at the top. If that was the case, you might want to use the vignette module to shift the vignette control down a little in the frame so that you can apply a stronger correction at the bottom of the frame than you would at the top. I don't know. That's just a, a hypothetical situation. So, as you can see, you can choose correct for distortion and chromatic aberration, but not vignetting, correct for distortion and vignetting, but not chromatic aberration, correct for chromatic aberration and vignetting, but not distortion, or any one of those just on their own. So you have all of those options available to you if you really want to get into the weeds. Next, we've got the geometry or the projection of the lens. Now, back in the days when I was just getting used to using Hugen for stitching panoramas, I did read up on all of these different projections, and I will confess most of it whoosh, straight over the top. 99% of the time, rectilinear is going to do the job for you because most of the time we're shooting images like this. They're just rectangular images at you know, sensible focal lengths, and we're not trying to do anything super duper crazy. If you're into astrophotography, if you're into um, architectural photography, there's quite a likelihood that you will get into using some of these other projections. And if you're into those types of photography, you probably already understand what these projections are for. Like I said, 99% of the time, rectilinear will do the trick for you. Next, we've got scale, and this allows us to scale the image in or out. As you choose negative values, you will end up with black pixels around the edge of the frame. And I would imagine you would only do this if you absolutely needed to see 100% of the pixels that were included at the time of capture but most of the time you're going to want something close to a value of 1. But the lens profile will set that value for you accordingly. Next up, we've got the chromatic aberration sliders, and I'm not going to try and demonstrate that on this particular image because there aren't any really high contrast delineations. You, you may be along the horizon there, but I doubt it. Let's zoom right in. Yeah, I mean, that's really not any great example of chromatic aberration there, so I'm not going to get too concerned with that. We'll talk about that when we get to the next image, which we'll do now. 
Okay, so this is an image I shot out in my backyard about an hour ago. And this was shot with my Venus Lauer 15mm f2 manual focus lens. And as it happens, this lens is not in the Lens Fund database. So that's a job for me to do. Go out and shoot some sample images with this lens, following the instructions and submit them and get this added to the database. Now, if we look at the image information here, we'll see the camera is identified as an A7 III, but lens, unknown, aperture, unknown, exposure is known because that comes from the body, not from the lens, and focal length, unknown. And when we come over to the lens correction module, we can see that the camera is identified in that first button, but in the button for the lens, it's just showing three dashes because it does not know what the lens was. What we can do though, is open up this list simply by left clicking on that tile. And what we've got is all of the manufacturers and then all of the lenses from each manufacturer that exist in the database listed. And what we want to do if our lens is not listed is try and find a profile that is close in focal length and close in maximum aperture to the lens on which we've shot our image. Now it just so happens that there is Venus and there is a Lauer 12mm f2.8 zero distortion lens. And it just so happens that my 15mm f2 is also a zero distortion lens. So it's part of the same family. So that's probably a good profile from which to start. Now, when I select it, I want you to watch the outside edges of the image. They will change ever so slightly. And there it goes. That was it. Now, that leads me to think that if I do profile the 15mm lens and submit those images to LensFun, I'm probably not going to see a massive amount of change by applying that lens profile. It's obviously a fairly good lens to begin with. At least that's my understanding. But once we have chosen a profile, even if it's not a perfect match for our lens, we can then adjust the scale and chromatic aberration sliders manually. There's only so much we can do with the focal length and aperture. The focal length will be limited to the focal length of the lens that was profiled. And in this case, the 12 mil was also a prime lens. So that's the only length that we can choose. But we can choose whatever aperture is appropriate to the image that we've shot. In this instance, I shot at f8, so I could choose f8. Distance, I could say, well, that gate was about three meters away, so we'll go with 2.8. Hopefully that's a close fit. And so far I'm not seeing a whole lot of change being applied to the image, and maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that just means the, the lens did a pretty good job straight out of the box, you know. In terms of scale, I don't need to scale it up or down if I wanted to narrow that down. I can see exactly when the black pixels start to encroach on my image, but I'm just going to leave it on one. Everything's there. In terms of chromatic aberration, there really isn't any on this image. If there was going to be some, it would probably be here where you've got this dark part of the gate and the very bright fence off in the background. But really, there isn't even any chromatic aberration there to worry about. But just to demonstrate, if there was a shift, it might appear like this, where your greens and magentas are offset or your blues and yellows are offset. And if that was the case, you would use these sliders to try and minimize any evidence of that color shift along high contrast edges. Like I said, this image doesn't suffer from it, so I really can't do much more to demonstrate that, but hopefully you get the idea. All right, people, that is pretty much it for the lens correction module. There's really not much else I can tell you. Do you need to use it? I don't think so. 
I think it really comes down to how anal you are about the way your lens represents the world. And if you feel, and I, and I guess this would come down to some of those really cheap lenses that, you know, I'm not going to mention countries or brands, but you know what I'm talking about. There are some lenses out there that are very low budget that are probably not using high quality manufacturing for their glass elements. Some of them might not even be using glass for the elements. You get the idea. If you're using one of those cheap lenses, then you may find that some of these problems are more pronounced. And so the lens correction module might be pretty much an essential module for your workflow. Your mileage may vary. All right. I will leave it there. Once again, Patreon people, thank you for your support. You know I love you. That's great. Uh, if anyone wants to support the work that I do, you'll find a link down below to the Patreon stuff. Uh, if there's any questions, comments, or feedback regarding this particular module, please sing out in the comments down below. If you have a better understanding of the geometry or the projections of lenses and you want to point us to some more information on that, go right ahead. Uh, I'm sure people would love to read up more. It'll uh, cure your insomnia, if nothing else. All right, people, I will leave it there. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.